The UK's debt tots up at around £5,000 per second. Currently at over £2 trillion, the annual cost of the interest alone amounts to about £48 billion a year. In 2016, the Rand Corporation were awarded a lucrative commission by the EU to make a study into one specific area of economic loss in Great Britain. It would transpire that in the previous 12 years, we had lost over 43 billion euros due to one factor alone. And what else in a post 9-11 society could that be? Oh yeah. But by who? The people collecting your hard-earned money to throw at this long-running profligate waste are Her Majesty's revenue and customs. A somewhat dark irony given Her Majesty only began paying taxes at the age of 66. But as of May 12, 2011, you have been quite lawfully entitled to withhold all payments to the UK government. These payments would include your council tax and your income tax. In fact, payments of any kind. The reason for this is as shocking as it is tragic. Fourteen summers ago, London suffered its worst bomb attack since the Blitz, and 56 people lost their lives in what has now become remembered as 7-7. And it gave rise to a court case and verdict we suspect few of you have even heard of, and doubt you were meant to. Following the attack, the British tabloids employed their usual calm and restraint, welcoming the inevitable raft of so-called security measures that now stands at at least one surveillance camera for every 11 people in the UK. Conversely, some chose to step back and review the day with a wider perspective, scrutinising the government's often conflicting and puzzling story on 7-7, writing books, making films, and disseminating information across the web. One of these films would lead to what is arguably the most extraordinary and legally significant, yet most unreported trials in modern history. This homemade desktop documentary would prompt the BBC into ensuring as many British households as possible were warned off such heresy, spending thousands upon thousands of licensed payers' money in the process to counter the claims of 7-7 ripple effect. John Hill. John Hill, BBC Conspiracy Files. Can I ask you why you've made a film accusing innocent people of mass murder on 7-7 with no evidence at all? Can I ask you why you're ignoring the huge weight of evidence against the four men blamed for the 7-7 bombing? You have made a film which is damaging trust in the British government and is undermining community cohesion in Britain. Is that your intention, Mr Hill? Since we caught up with him, John Hill has been arrested. He is facing extradition to the UK on a charge of perverting the course of justice by sending DVDs of 7-7 Ripple Effect to the judge and jury foreman in a trial linked to 7-7. True enough, John Hill had anonymously sent copies of Ripple Effect to the judge and jury at Kingston Crown Court in 2008, because he feared that the three men on trial, who were charged with assisting the alleged 7-7 bombers, may well suffer a miscarriage of justice, were relevant information not made available. Details of John's hearing in Ireland make it very clear that the reason for his extradition was because he had not only questioned the official story on 7-7, but that he'd made the assertion that agents of the UK government had actually carried it out. And so for 150 days he awaited trial at Wandsworth Prison until May 2011, where he stood trial at Southwark Crown Court facing a potential life imprisonment for daring to suggest the unthinkable. In court, John was confronted by the considerable skills of the publicly funded prosecution, 
who again pointed out the allegedly baseless accusations made in his documentary. We doubt Miss Darlow cared to mention such cases as Operation Northwoods or Gladio, the Newburg Four. And if you Google any of them, you'll see why. And so on May the 11th, the third day of the trial, the jury was shown the hour-long 7-7 ripple effect, a film which, according to the BBC, contained no evidence at all. Having taken just three hours to return from their deliberations, the jury foreman announced they couldn't reach a unanimous verdict. So the judge, reportedly quite unfriendly to John Hill, stated he would accept a majority verdict of no less than 10 to 2. It would then take just 90 minutes before the jury returned with the majority verdict. What followed from our giants of the British press and TV was this. The almost total silence from the UK mainstream media spoke volumes for the enormity of the jury's decision and its implications for the establishment. One of the few useful reports on the verdict came from John's native Yorkshire, that well-known epicentre of British journalism. If you wish to find the BBC's grovelling apology, that never happened and it took them a whole month before they added this to one of their lesser-read web pages. Likewise, Annabelle's glowing CV, perhaps unsurprisingly, has no mention of the case amongst their impressive victories in the War on Terror. So what are the legal implications? Well, when a jury decides that a film alleging the British government murdered 56 of its own citizens is fair comment, it's not too unreasonable a question to ask, if that was the case, who funded it? Now take a wild guess. So, what is reasonable cause in law? Reasonable cause is, to have knowledge of facts which although not amounting to direct knowledge, would cause a reasonable person, knowing the same facts, to reasonably conclude the same thing. It's pretty much common sense, but a crude analogy would go something like this. If you were caught dressed like him, running from a place like that, don't be surprised if a witness decides to call one of those. However, to prove your innocence or otherwise, you'd need one of these, a jury, and a rather convincing story about how you were late for a fancy dress party to persuade them you weren't a thief. But if you did, and you were found not guilty. That's because the prosecution failed to prove, beyond a reasonable doubt, you were lying. And beyond a reasonable doubt means a lot more than reasonable cause in law. So when you think about John Hill's case, like some of us, you might want to contact the Home Office, HMRC, the adjudicator of HMRC, your local council solicitor, even the lawyers who represent your police. If you're really desperate, you could try your MP, but let's be honest. All of them, when confronted with the implications of the ripple effect verdict, will unquestionably resort to evasive gibberish of the worst variety. Your local council legal team will doubtless instruct you to keep paying them no matter what, no matter for what, citing cases that have nothing to do with the London bombings or state-sponsored terrorism. And you'll find they know as much about that as most of us know about neurosurgery. A high-flying lawyer or QC are prohibitively expensive to ask for help, and in my experience, won't want to discuss the John Hill case, even if they worked on it. But the fact remains, John Hill wasn't extradited and slung in jail for vague reasons. It was specifically written that what he had done by making and sending ripple effect to a trial very closely linked to the 7-7 attacks, even though his DVDs were intercepted and never reached the judge and jury at Kingston, his actions were deemed a serious threat to the establishment's version of the truth. An act done with the intention of perverting the course of justice is not enough. The act must also have that tendency 
To establish a tendency or a possibility, the prosecution do not have to prove that the tendency or possibility in fact materialised. There must be a possibility that what the accused has done, without more, might lead to injustice. But having watched a documentary that very clearly stated that the attacks were orchestrated by agents of the state, a jury, the highest benchmark surely in assessing matters of guilt or innocence, decided that John Hill's film would not lead to an injustice. On the contrary, having spoken to several witnesses at the John Hill trial, they're of the impression the jury gave considerable credence to 7-7 ripple effect. The most egregious offenders for convenient deafness and irrelevant answers to your questions are HMRC, who seem to struggle with the pretty clear wording of the Terrorism Act. A person commits an offence if he provides money or other property and knows or has reasonable cause to suspect that it will or may be used for the purposes of terrorism. In this section, a reference to the provision of money or other property is a reference to it being given, lent or otherwise made available whether or not for consideration. This last bit means that it doesn't matter even if the money you're handing over is to pay for something, and that includes your taxes, especially when you have reasonable cause to believe that money could be used in a terror attack. If you really want to see how desperately evasive the tax man can get when confronted with all this, and bearing in mind there are zero exceptions to funding terrorism as confirmed by the Home Office, take a look at this patronising tripe. Perhaps it would help if I explained in a bit more detail why we are unable to take you up on your offer to review the information you hold, which shows that we use your taxes to fund terrorism. The obligation to pay tax is a general one. All tax goes into the consolidated fund, and taxes are not earmarked to any particular purpose. As the law stands at present, there are no provisions for a taxpayer to withhold tax on grounds of conscience, or to decide to which part of government expenditure they would like their payments to be allocated. Well, thanks mate, but that's not what you were asked. You were asked why I had to pay taxes when reasonable cause had been created by a British jury for me to believe 7-7 was an inside job. That's not just a matter of conscience, that's a huge matter of law. I explained the John Hill case to my local one of these, just to make sure if the ripple effect jury verdict created lawful, reasonable cause to think 7-7 was a state crime, and he said. So why do HMRC behave as if they're above the law when they're not? I'm sure most tax people are charming. I know a few, and they're surprisingly quite human. They may often seem like faceless bureaucrats with an inflated notion of self-importance, but we'd never suggest they approve of funding terrorism. So who's telling them to ignore the law? Because they have no divine right to do so. And I have another letter from the Home Office, who are kind of important, just to clarify it. Whilst they're not subject to the terrorism law in the bit about Crown servants, they are most certainly bound by what the Home Office describe as necessary implication. And that means, if reasonable cause is shown that the monies they collect just even may be being used for criminal purposes. That is well beyond their remit. And as far as you're concerned, Section 17 of the Terrorism Act applies to you at work. Even if it's your boss or company paying your taxes via PAYE, once you have reasonable cause to suspect your income may be funding terrorism, they have to stop paying HMRC until these questions have been cleared up. And when you see 7-7 ripple effects like the jury did, you'll realise there's an awful lot to be answered. We're not suggesting for one second that you bog off to the Cayman Islands with your tax money, like David Cameron's old man. We are suggesting you might get some advice on escrow accounts or trusts, and most certainly withhold your union dues if affiliated to political types. Talk to a solicitor, your accountant, if you've got one or even the one at work, Talk to CAB if you're skint like the rest of us. If you're really desperate, try your MP again. But always remember, you've got reasonable cause. It's worth revisiting who is in charge on 7-7. 
and some of the dangerous fiction he'd have us believe in the past. He is, without any question, still trying to develop that I am quite chemical, sure, biological, I think most potentially are, nuclear capability. That he has these weapons. And, and, to allow him to and that the people in the documentation exist the document. to show that. And the truth is, this issue of weapons of mass destruction is... Would you buy an official story off this man? I always associate him with lies and death, and how he was very keen to bury any notion of a full and proper investigation into the London bombings. We know that you don't like public inquiries, I mean, full sort of stop, really. Um, but there has been, well, my experience of them is, well, yes. but there has been a call from uh, victims' families, and also from the Muslim working groups for public inquiry, not just into intelligence and policing issues, but into the underlying reasons why such an event as last year's bombings could happen. You may not like public inquiries, but it would meet a demand from an awful lot of people to have such an inquiry. Why is your opposition so implacable when it would seem to be a very positive gesture both towards victims and the wider community? I believe that if we had a public inquiry, we would divert, di divert enormous amounts of resource and energy commitment from the police to the security services. I believe at the moment we have a clear active threat. I want our police and our security services focused on dealing with that threat. If they end up being engaged in a public inquiry, the reality is, no matter what people might want or say they want at the outset, is that the resource and commitment and energy of those services will be diverted into that in circumstances where we know what has happened. Even if you never lost someone on 7-7, how do you feel knowing you might have paid for it. Most of you will do nothing with this information, and that's what they count on. This country is something of a tradition of doing nothing until it's too late, of not seeing the obvious until time has run out and we're left rearranging the deck chairs. But when the law is thrown overboard, purely to protect a questionable system, one has to ask what kind of system it is. If you wish to obey the law, you should take this information to your friendly local police and ask them to do the job you've been paying them for. They're not all self-serving robots who take orders from anyone providing they're in a job. Not all, anyway. We know a lot of you will carry on doing this in the deluded hope things will change for the better. Many of you will still rely on this for your view of the world, but please bear in mind, it wasn't them that told you about the verdict at Southwark, quite the opposite. Take the time to consider who and what you might be paying for. Take an hour to watch the film that brought a British jury to the decision it did. You can then send it to these people and ask them why the law doesn't seem to apply when it's inconvenient for the state. And remember when you ask them, they're public servants. Why, after a case brought by the government, and no doubt funded by you, is a jury's verdict not reasonable cause? Because if it isn't, what the hell is? Think about why that verdict failed to receive the same level of press coverage and publicity as when the BBC was seeking to tell millions using licence payers' money what a bad man John Hill was, and how 7-7 ripple effect was without substance. Again, Ask yourself why it was actually ignored and not treated as one of the most shocking and significant moments in modern legal history, as it should have been. The verdict on 7-7 ripple effect came six days after the coroner's findings had been handed down from an inquest ordered, approved and controlled by the government. Those findings were well publicised in the mainstream press and on TV, and one imagines many of the jurors may well have seen them yet over 80% of them still chose to conclude that an inside job on 7-7 was plausible. Maybe it makes sense why Mr Blair didn't want a full independent public inquiry, and it should make every one of us wonder why the BBC chose to tell the nation 7-7 ripple effect contained no evidence at all. 
No honest establishment should fear full and independent scrutiny. Form groups to raise money for legal help if you have to. If you've got around five grand spare, try to purchase the trial transcript. Don't be fobbed off by the authorities. You're obeying the law. Insist your local police support you, then watch how our transparent establishment reacts. If you think the UK would go bust by withholding your taxes, remember the two trillion debt, and until these matters are clarified, at least try to stop feeding them the only thing they seem to care about. Your money. And for what? Thank <laughs> you.